Hey everybody, welcome to Average Guy Opinions. I'm your average guy, John Corelli. I'm trying to speak a little more clearly. I hope you guys can hear me well on these videos. I'm just doing it on my phone. Like I've mentioned before, it's unscripted, so there's a lot of ums and ahs and pauses and eye rolls. And I appreciate you guys for watching. Uh, like I, I also mentioned in my last long ass 22, 23 minute video uh, where I kind of poured my heart out, which is fine. Like I said, also in that video, um, I see another nice pause for you. Uh, this is ther this self therapy for me, and I like I said also in that video. I hope I enlighten people once in a while, or just see something about it. And within that enlightenment, and I already forgot what I was going to say before that because that's the way this crazy brain works or doesn't. Um, I did want to make this kind of a third or two parter, as I see it. I, I do ten minute videos essentially. You guys know that if you've followed me at all. And uh, this will be another 10 minute or, um, but it's backing up the 22 minute one, which I'm going to give myself um, a reprieve on and call that a two parter. Um, so I'm going to give my credit. It's going to be episodes 10 and 11. This is episode 12 you're watching. And I wanted to give the men in my life a little bit of reprieve. Uh, I, cause I kind of called my dad and stepdad out on things they really I don't want, want to say they necessarily couldn't control, but they probably didn't get the tools to control them. And that was part of that old school thought that I mentioned in the last video, right? Um, backgrounds on both of them. My, my biological father, he's, both of these men are still alive, still in my lives. And I'm glad. I'm glad I've maintained these relationships because they have value. These men have incredible value. And they've been through a lot of pain, too. Um, my My... Biological father was the third of four children, the middle of the three boys, and simply was not loved by his mother. Can you imagine? And my mom witnessed it. You know, my mom is not his biggest supporter. She has a lot of issues with my dad, but she's also been very, very great about and realistic about what he's been through and what he's done. Yeah, he didn't get love, so it's hard for him to love unconditionally, the way I needed it as a kid. I think I got it as a kid. I think as I grew into an adult, in fact, I know as I grew into an adult, into adulthood, he couldn't, he couldn't provide it. He couldn't accept that I was different from him and different, and maybe an individual didn't need him. And, uh, a narcissist needs that. He is a narcissist. I'm not going to back off of that, but there's a reason, you know, he didn't get what he needed and it hurts. And like I said, my mom observed it when I was little and you know, that, cha that, that changes you, that creates you. And so I want to give my biological father a little credit. My mom has always said, Hey, he stuck around for you. When we got divorced back in 1974, he could have bailed. He could have gone back to New York and not given you a second thought. And he didn't do that. He stayed around for you. And so I have to be thankful for that. Not have to, but I am. Um, my mom and I had a falling out when I was 17, halfway through senior year of uh, high school. <clears throat> she kicked me out. Um, which is fine. Technically against the law, but fine. I needed it. Honestly, it was a kick in the pants I needed. I went and lived with my dad for the next three and a half years. And then right before I turned 21, I got out on my own. But it was good to have him there for me. It was good to learn good and things bad, good and bad things about him during those three and a half years. Um, see his emotions when his brother died of AIDS in 1988. See that the man was also vulnerable. And... Have that understanding, and although I didn't know this until much later, of his need for love and his lack of getting it, and his attempt to give it to me. I think he really tried. I really do. And I think he understood love, but as he's gotten older, he's gotten more bitter. I remember, uh, and I wish I could find it somewhere, <laughs> I've always told people there are only three things I wanted for my dad in this life when he dies. His record collection, which I have here at home, because <laughs> I'm storing it for him until he decides to sell it or I keep it or whatever happens. A Lenny Bruce poster, which is an 8 by 11 because Lenny Bruce is one of my comedy heroes. It was just a little flyer, well, not even a poster. It was an 8 by 11 that we somehow got lost. He's convinced I, I have it. I go, no, if I had it, it would be up prominently as soon as I got at home in 1988 when I moved into my first place, right? <laughs> into my into my apartment on my own where I started my independent life. No, Lenny Bruce, that would have been somewhere prominently on my wall every place I, I lived. I guarantee you, Dad, if you don't have it, it's lost. 
And then the third thing, which I also can't find, but I thought I saw it when I was helping him move a couple years ago into assisted living, was a Martin Luther King. Uh, it was just, it looked like an advertisement, to be honest. It was also 8 by 11 It was also framed. My dad taking the time and care to frame it and put it up. Um, and it's just dawning on me now the difference between those two men that were extremely prominent in the 60s. <laughs> I mean, they, they both supported some of the same things. Lenny Bruce was definitely in favor of the civil rights movement, um, as was obviously uh, Martin Luther King. And I will do a Martin Luther King video eventually. That's not where I'm going with this. But you talk about two guys expressing it in very different ways, uh, what our rights are, not only as, as a Jewish comic and as a black activist, but just as humans, what our rights, our fundamental rights should be and how they express them. Very different, right? <laughs> Lenny Bruce was arrested on stage for cursing too much. And Martin Luther King was arrested out on the streets for protesting too much. Anyway, but back to my, my point, that was the third thing I wanted from my dad was he had a Martin Luther King thing that, like I said, I think it was an advertisement, which is kind of a bummer, but it said, don't tell when I die, don't, don't, I have my eulogy, don't tell people how I've won over 400 awards um, for nonviolent protest and other things. He said, just tell people that Martin Luther King tried to love somebody. <laughs> and it chokes me up because my dad did try to love me. But unfortunately, his brain was so hardwired from not getting that love himself uh, that, that he just didn't know how to love people that didn't do what he wanted. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm going to turn this into a 10 minute video about my dad and then I'll do a backup one about my stepdad. Um, and, and also the other men that were brought into my life because of my stepdad, but continuing in the next three minutes with my father, I get it. And it's why I'm here for him at the end. I'm, I, I, we can't connect. It's, it's horrific. I wish we could once in a while he cracks a little joke and once in a while, and he's very good about asking about the kids. He really is. He asks about his grandkids every time we talk. And, every, you know, and all the time when he, when he texts. So in those ways, he's, he's very good. But the bitterness of not getting what he wanted in this life and the bitterness of not what he wanted with me and our relationship and how he wanted me to turn out, it's, 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 it's destroyed our relationship. I try to show up for him because I'm his only son. I'm his only kid. And really all he has left in this life are a few people that visit him from time to time, mostly through the church, some friends he made uh, at the, his local church up in North Glen for the last 10, 20 years. Uh, a priest that visits him, visits him on a weekly basis. His wife, who has been out of town for the last two years but has returned and is being helpful. And me. And, you know, and the other people that are... Uh, on the fringe, I don't even, not the fringe, just uh, the people that provide for him daily at the assisted living. That's who he has in his life. And I, I really, my dream with this man was that I would go over to his house as he aged and just listen to the wonderful jazz collection he has. He's had it packed away for 20 years. It's kind of a microcosm of his life. There's stuff there to enjoy but it's not out to be enjoyed. It's all packed away. He has an amazing hi-fi system. I have a tube amp that's probably worth thousands of dollars. It's in a box, sitting, waiting. I actually tried to set up the stereo equipment, get it ready, get the turntable ready, but there were wires missing, and I have been too lazy to get them, get the right wires to get this thing hooked up. I'm busy, too, to my credit. But that's a big one for me. That was That, that hurts that... That couldn't happen because of his lifestyle. It's it's about hoarding and and holding on to stuff, including your relationships. You know, like I said, it's a microcosm of his life. This record collection. My mom used to tell me she was not allowed to touch the records because she didn't know how back in the '60s. And so that control, even to the point of not enjoying life is what that man is dealing with and has gone through. And it, and it came from a place of not getting loved. And so I do have sympathy for him, even though a lot of times it seems like I don't. Anyway, uh, that's about 10 minutes. Uh, I'm going to go on to my stepdad next and uh, play, you know, amateur psychiatrist or psychologist. I don't know why I'm doing air quotes for that. But 
that's my 10 minutes. Thank you for listening. And uh, thanks as always for watching and listening. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.